Would you continue to go outside if you knew you were always going to be met with hijinks and goofs? Hi gang, wanna watch a TV show? Today we are going to be talking about Scooby-Doo. I grew up surrounded by this franchise. I love it so much. I have, the, to prove my love, I've had this, you can tell it's gotten a lot of love, um, this state-of-the-art plushie of Scooby-Doo and this Scooby-Doo pillow, both I believe from like the very very early 2000s. So I'm a I'm a day one fan. Well I'm a day since my day one fan and as I've gotten older I've been very curious to see how it's maintained a impact on our pop culture. So today come along with me as we watch a bunch of Scooby-Doo and talk about it. Now there are 14 different iterations of the Scooby-Doo TV shows and what we'll do to kind of break this down is look at each network and see which one did this series the best. What we're going to do is we are going to look at the top rated and most viewed videos and analyze from there what was most successful in sort of the consistencies and changes between each version of this show. As we've established there's a lot to get through here, so we're going to try and keep this train moving. What we're going to do to try and speed this up is look at those two factors and assume that if they're the best rated and most viewed, they gotta be the best. CBS presents this program in color. For CBS, it is very obvious which one I'm going to say is the best one. Obviously, it will be the very first run of the show they did, Scooby-Doo. Where are you? This series was the catalyst for what Scooby-Doo is today. It was the first iteration. I cannot talk about how successful this franchise is without mentioning this series. This series was created when CBS and Hanna-Barbera both decided to team up and create non-violent children's programming for Saturday morning cartoons that weren't focused on superheroes because a lot of parents were upset that the programming was too violent. While this franchise was always going to be these four teenagers and their dog and Encountering the supernatural more often than not unwillingly. Something that was discussed very early on by the writers was making the Mystery Inc. as we know it today a music group and they would be called Mysteries 5. And you can tell based on how many bands Mystery Inc. helps with in the entire franchise that music was something that was always kind of on their minds. In the original iteration of Scooby-Doo, the writers were so bored with Fred and Daphne's characters that they decided what they were going to do was try to keep them off screen as much as possible. Instead of, I don't know, writing interesting characters, the writers decided to write the characters as boring individuals and that they would always be away from the rest of the group looking for clues. Something else that came out of this series was the established Scooby-Doo episode format that would be used for the rest of time it feels like. Step one, the Mystery Inc. gang would either be on their way to or from a super cool teenage function when suddenly the mystery machine just breaks down. And of course it breaks down near an abandoned building or property. Step two, the gang then discovers that their destination is haunted. And of course, these teenagers decide to volunteer to help with the case, and the adults decide to let the teenagers risk their lives. Step three, the gang splits up to find clues. In this, we have Fred and Velma doing primarily the clue finding. Daphne normally falls into some kind of trap, and Scooby and Shaggy are off looking for fun, food, but they always run into the monster and a chase scene ensues. Step four, once the gang has found enough clues to decide that there is just someone behind this and the monster is not possibly real, they set a trap. Step five, the traps sometimes work. For a big trap man, Fred is really bad at making effective traps and Scooby normally falls into them. The gang starts scrambling to catch the creature and once the suspect is apprehended, they take off the mask and realize, oh hey, we know you. And once the mask comes off, we realize that these teenagers foiled a crime scheme that was going on to the point that local police couldn't do anything to help. And the last step, as the offender is being taken away, they normally shout something along the lines of, and I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling kids and your dog. 
While this makes every single episode very predictable, the fans found comfort in this formula and it goes to show how successful it was because look at where Scooby-Doo is today. Clearly they knew something when they were making this formula. This stretch of Scooby-Doo only ran for about two years from 1969 to 1970, but it ended up being scrapped once they started seeing declining reviews. Of course, I think the studio realized that some people connected with the Scooby gang, and so after a two-year hiatus, they came out with a new series. This new series was called the Scooby-Doo Movies, and it had special guests inside of it, like Robin and Batman or the Addams Family, to try and keep the content fresh. But this series also didn't last very long and was cancelled due to the ratings. This show didn't resume until 1976 when it was transferred to ABC. ABC. Despite the transfer and implied success, ABC really struggled to get a solid formula down when it came to making Scooby-Doo TV shows. I feel like what stopped the ABC versions of Scooby-Doo from succeeding was they leaned too much into the comedic part of it and neglected the part that's the supernatural and spooky part of it. None of these shows really had fully fleshed out mysteries or even partially fleshed out mysteries because I'll be honest, the original series and original run of Scooby-Doo was not that deep. Because of this struggle to figure out what a unique take on Scooby-Doo would be that would keep audience retention, ABC created one of the worst dogs to ever exist, Scrappy-Doo. As a kid, I never really liked Scrappy-Doo. I didn't really have a good reason as to why when I was a child. I just knew every time he spoke, I didn't like anything about him. I decided to take a brief hiatus from researching the show to just diving into Scrappy-Doo lore. Scrappy first came into the Scooby-Doo cinematic universe, the SDCU for short, in 1979 in the series Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. He arrived at a bad time in the franchise where there's a lot of instability with production and writing teams and his character ended up being pretty irritating for most audiences. Hanna-Barbera noticed an initial spike when Scrappy-Doo came along, and of course, like most companies, they just overused him until audiences got sick of seeing him. After a pretty steep decline in viewership and Hanna-Barbera realizing that if they kept using Scrappy-Doo, they would have no more fans, production ended up cutting his character, and now he's only used in a negative way, such as a joke or a villain of an episode. He was officially cut in 1988 with his last appearance being Scooby-Doo and the Reluctant Werewolf, which that VHS tape was on loop in my household growing up. Because the studio tried capitalizing on Scrappy-Doo, it sort of led to this career burn where nobody could stand seeing him because he was everywhere. It's sort of like what happened when Despicable Me came out and the Minions started to gain traction, where at first everyone was like, these guys are so weird. And then there reached a point where we were like, if I see a minion, I'm drop kicking him. I believe that this initial spike in viewership when they saw Scrappy-Doo introduced was not because of the character, but rather there was something new and something changing with the formula. While change is nice, it is rarely welcomed, and with something as predictable as the Scooby-Doo formula, you have to do all these things to keep it fresh, but audiences normally don't like when it changes. Scrappy-Doo was given the personality traits of Fred, Velma, and Daphne, and I feel as though because the studio gave him those traits and then cut those characters, audiences weren't happy to see characters they liked disappear. Because of the dramatic shift in the cast of this show, and because of the oversaturation of his character, a lot of people to this day still hate Scrappy-Doo for ever existing. After deciding that Scrappy-Doo was a bad idea, ABC tried to rein it back in with a series called A Pup Named Scooby-Doo. I believe this version of Scooby-Doo very much saved the franchise. Aired from 1988 to 1991, this series very much capitalized on the trend of babyfication that was happening in a lot of TV shows. There were TV shows like The Muppet Babies and Tiny Toons, where these characters that were so well known and beloved became baby versions of themselves. And this sort of change was very well received by the general public. This was the first iteration of Scooby-Doo to make it to three seasons. While it was a very different tone and style to the original run of this series, people were very happy to see the original gang back together for the first time since the 70s, and Scrappy-Doo was out of the picture. 
With this boost in support, writers and producers started to see that people weren't just wanting to see one or two characters solve mysteries, but rather the entire gang. What they failed to realize, though, was audiences can't watch the same thing over and over, and thus this show was also canceled. After a decade-long break and a banging new theme song by Simple Plan, fans welcomed in this new era of Scooby-Doo with What's New, Scooby-Doo? Kids WB does not assume responsibility. Aired from 2002 to 2006, this is the era of Scooby-Doo that I grew up with most. This is the one that I identify and think of when I think of Scooby-Doo. Production of this series had been delayed for a while because of the foreclosure of Hanna-Barbera Studios and the death of William Hanna, who was a co-founder of the Hanna-Barbera Studios. The success from this show, however, is very much derivative of Scooby-Doo Where Are You because they copied so much of it. Since they returned to the original format of this series, the fans came back excited to see their franchise returning to what they remembered it as. Because fans were so excited to see their favorite iteration of this show return in a newer, more modern animation style, they were able to rally enough support around this series to get three seasons out of it. But of course, ratings and oh my gosh, we have to cancel the thing. But because this was canceled, we got one of my favorite iterations of a Scooby-Doo TV show. Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated broke outside of the traditional format for a Scooby-Doo episode. There was a through plot through the entire season that allowed simultaneously for each episode to stand on its own, but there was an overarching story and mystery that the gang was trying to solve. This is the first sort of successful format of this show and fans were excited to see a new take on the gang solving mysteries. And maybe I'm a little biased because Matthew Lillard is in it and he's my favorite Shaggy. I'm Mary Jane. Like that is my favorite name. Really? Yeah. But something I liked is that they didn't neglect the original voice of Shaggy, Casey Keem. Instead, they incorporated him in a different way by having him play Shaggy's father. Linda Cardellini is also in this series, who plays Velma in the live action movies. Who's your mommy? And her character's name is Hot Dog Water, which is everything to me. This is one of my favorite iterations of Scooby-Doo because it simultaneously stuck to the charm of the original series, but expanded each character and gave them more depth by having a through story. You could get more insight into who these individuals were because you were experiencing them solve one big mystery in addition to smaller mysteries, instead of being able to dive in and dive back out. It gave you more of a window into their lives than previous iterations of Scooby-Doo had. Outside of the story, the animation style very much harkens back to the original run of the show, but it's a little more stylistic and all the gadgets that they use in the show are a little more modern to adapt to the time period that it came out in. The series was so successful that it actually didn't get canceled because of low viewership. I tried to find a reason why online, but I couldn't really figure it out other than I'm assuming there were other things more popular at the time and there was a different trend that Cartoon Network was going in that they canceled the show. Its abrupt end from the studio caused fans to be reasonably upset, I think, but then they reacted by hate bombing the next version that Cartoon Network came out with. The next version of this series was all right. It was Be Cool Scooby-Doo and again it leaned too much into the comedic part of it and forgot the whole mystery solving part of the Scooby-Doo franchise. Going from an in-depth story and look into these characters lives to flashy jokes and dumbed down versions of the characters made fans rightfully upset I think. This show premiered during the time of Teen Titans Go and Uncle Grandpa which you can tell because it impacted the way that the show is designed and written. It's unfortunate to see that because I think Cartoon Network was trying to appeal to those who liked the shows like Teen Titans Go and Uncle Grandpa, but I think the kids watching weren't interested in Scooby-Doo. It also didn't help that it didn't focus on the entirety of Mystery Inc, but rather Scooby, Shaggy, and their robot buddy, Roby. This series downfall paralleled the downfall of most ABC shows where they were trying to change the format so much that fans hated it. 
There was also a whole behind the scenes drama to this show. There's a whole Reddit post about it that I'll link in the description down below. What it essentially boils down to is Cartoon Network was ignoring the appeal of Scooby-Doo and decided to try and mimic their shows that they were running during this time instead of looking at what was successful within the franchise and going based off of that. This cocktail of bad reviews, upset fans, and trouble behind the scenes, Cartoon Network pulled this show in 2018. It's hard to talk about a successful iteration of Scooby-Doo on HBO Max because the two versions that they have are Scooby-Doo Guess Who and Velma. Velma has reached more individuals and has more streams than Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, but a lot of it is hate watching. It has a 1.6 out of 10 on IMDb with over 74,000 reviews on it. Scooby-Doo and Guess Who was much more loved by people, but it reached less people. It had a 7.4 out of 10 on IMDb, but there's less than 2,000 reviews on it. At the end of the day, streaming platforms are going to continue to renew shows that get more views, whether or not it's hate watching. All this to say, I think we're going to take a look at both shows here. Scooby-Doo and Guess Who followed a very similar premise as the new Scooby-Doo movies, where there were special guests on each episode. These guests would aid Mystery Inc. in solving any sort of mystery that they came across. Some of these celebrities include, but are not limited to, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, Cher, Joey Chestnut, Jeff Foxworthy, Morgan Freeman, and Whoopi Goldberg. Truly an array of individuals to be on this TV show. Despite trying to replicate the success of the 1970 TV show, it just didn't bring in enough viewers to justify it running, and so it was cancelled after its second season. That's the pitfall, I think, that a lot of these Scooby-Doo shows have fallen into, where you want to keep it recognizable to bring the fans in, but unique enough to keep viewer retention up. This show was just not able to spice up the formula enough to keep viewers and audiences in, despite its seemingly positive reactions and reviews. It was just, I think, a little too recognizable for audiences. So let's take a look at something unrecognizable. Velma was the first attempt at a Scooby-Doo adult series. It featured Mystery Inc. in this like love quadrangle where Daphne and Shaggy were in love with Velma, but Velma was in love with Fred. I think this went way too extreme in trying to change the Scooby-Doo formula. While we've shown that breaking out of the formula does lead to success sometimes, you still need to keep identifiable elements in it. The humor very much comes across as corporate America trying to relate to its underpaid employees, and the writing was a little too meta. And this is not a dig on Mindy Kaling. I think she's a very talented writer and actress. Let's just look at her list of successful episodes of The Office that she wrote. We have The Injury, The Dundies, Niagara, Chair Model, Branch Wars. After scrolling through the writers of each episode, it doesn't seem like she had anything necessarily to do with the writing. She was just an executive producer. But at the same time as a producer, if you make a bad show, that's going to impact how people view your writing. Because the people behind Velma took a classic show formula and then kind of did a 180 with it, people reacted extreme to this. It was a swing and a miss because it tried to replicate the formula from Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated of having a through plot through the entire series that the gang was trying to solve, but the comedy didn't land with a lot of the audience members. It all falls apart when the tone of the show is inconsistent and they're trying to cram in as many pop culture references and adult themes into this TV show. At the end of the day, this is just a show about teenagers solving mysteries with their talking dog. It shouldn't be that complicated. In my opinion, I didn't like Velma. I tried really hard to watch it. I tried to get into it, but I just, I couldn't get past the writing. It felt too cliche. Also, they cut Scooby-Doo from this show. That's like cutting Harry Potter from the Harry Potter franchise. How are you going to cut the guy that the franchise is named after? It very much was they didn't understand the world that they were trying to build, and because of that, no one could get behind this show. <laughs> I think when it comes to looking at the success of these TV shows, you have to have to look at the predictability of each 
episode. There's comfort in predictable plots and nostalgia, and Scooby-Doo, I think, has been able to capitalize on that comfort. Whether you watched it once or your entire lifetime, I think most people can say what the formula for a Scooby-Doo episode is, because we're so ingrained in it, and we're so, our pop culture revolves around it. When you watch this franchise. What you can tell is what was popular during the time, what the style was during the time, and you can see what the culture was like. Scooby-Doo is very much ingrained in our modern world, whatever time period that may be. I think the biggest flaw with it, though, is trying to keep the content exciting and fresh. During the stretch of time from 1976 to 1985, there were eight different versions of Scooby-Doo because the production teams and writers behind this series just couldn't figure out entirely the world that they wanted to build and figure out enough mysteries for the kids to solve. And I feel like that's a revolving question for writers of all Scooby-Doo episodes is how many mysteries can one solve? I think what Velma did well and Mystery Incorporated did well was they had a through story in each season so that they have one big overarching mystery that they're trying to solve and they don't have to worry about the small mysteries in each episode to keep it changing and fresh. There's also this huge lack of inclusivity in the Scooby-Doo shows and I think that's something that Velma was trying to tackle, it's just it didn't do a great job at tackling it. I believe that there is a good way to accomplish this change in movement for inclusivity but when you stray so far away from what the franchise is known as, which is kids solving mysteries and having fun, you start to lose people. When Shaggy wore a red shirt in the 80s, people lost their minds. So if you're looking to do a complete overhaul of the character designs and change it so that it is more inclusive, you need to make sure that your writing and your world is up to code. I hope that Scooby-Doo isn't going away anytime soon and I hope we're not witnessing a death of a franchise because they're trying so hard to reinvent this series. When you watch Scooby-Doo you know the gang is always going to win and they're always going to be able to put away the bad guy and also it's like Freddie Prince Jr. once said it was a talking dog you know what I mean but with this competition surrounding uniqueness and trying to do a fresh take on the Scooby-Doo franchise you start to lose more and more fans because it's not like the original content. Nostalgia for Scooby-Doo is both a blessing and a curse. Seeing your characters all come together and solve mysteries is great, but when the writing and the style is so out of touch with what people are familiar with and remember from childhood, people get upset. People try so hard to preserve their childhood in this show that it gives writers no space to move around and explore with these characters and see what they're truly capable of. And besides, there's only so many mysteries that can be solved. Writers are inevitably going to fall into the trap of we don't know what else the kids can solve. And studios offer little to no support to the writers to try and figure out how to answer that question. And it's not just a Scooby-Doo issue. There have been shows running my entire lifetime that don't have great writing, but they have good viewership and so they stay on the air. Studios are very quick to cancel shows without offering any support or room or time to let audiences build for a show. Low viewers means low money. And I can't have that. I've become very accustomed to a certain kind of lifestyle. We can see with the writer strike and the SAG strike going on right now that the money from viewership is not going to the people who are actually creating the product that you watch. It's going to studio executives. Since the money from a show is going to the people who have very little involvement in the show and have more money than they'll ever be able to spend in their lifetime, I see no harm in giving TV shows more time to figure out their world and to flesh it out more. These artists are behind so much content that we consume, but corporate greed is just killing creativity. Disney is actively trying to cut costs by exploring AI and using that for upcoming projects. And AI is all right. I'm not against it personally. I've used it quite a bit, but it can't capture the spectrum of human emotion that a human can. It can't see the complexity behind every single decision we make and our motivations inside. It just can generate a idea of that. If we don't pay our writers and actors properly, you end up with these very 2D, stereotypical, flat characters that the audiences have trouble connecting to. It's disheartening to see that corporations are not only willing to sacrifice the artists and writers who have made them the money that they have now, but also to ruin the viewer experience because they don't 
want to help out their actors and writers more. Recently, Marvel tried to use AI for the Secret Invasion title cards, and there was a lot of pushback on that. There's a certain human touch to art no matter what form it is, that AI just cannot recreate. Whenever AI creates something, you lose the humanity that's behind the art, and you can absolutely tell that with the Marvel title sequence. I mean, just look at these. I mean, looking at the Secret Invasion title card, it's empty. Even though there is a lot happening in them, I can't, it just, it doesn't feel right. Scooby-Doo writers and writers really everywhere have faced this problem of if you do not have a fully flushed out world before you even start the project and before you can even work with the actors, you lose viewers and your show gets canceled. I don't believe it's fair to not give artists a chance to explore these characters because once they start to really get a handle and control on who they imagine these characters to be, then the writing starts to click and everything meshes well. Let me know what you think though down below. I know we've covered a lot in this video and if you are still watching, thank you so much! The more videos that I make, the more I sort of find my style in content, so let me know if you have anything you'd like to see from me down below. And if you want to see other videos I've made, I've left a couple links in the description. This is my third whole video, guys. How did I do that? Leave a like and comment down below. Let's talk Scooby-Doo. What's your favorite version of this show? What's your favorite run? Who's your favorite character? Maybe someday I'll dive into the world of the Scooby-Doo movies because that's a whole other trip to go down, but I'm willing to take that journey. I'll send a little smooch your way and I'll see you next time.